let me know. Okay, well, so first of all, hello everyone. We have the pleasure to, to be here with Javi, a PhD student of quantum computing and CEO of Quantum Maths and a startup in the Basque country. And well, I think that that's all yours. Javi, thank you very much for being here. Thank you for the invitation, Alberto, and for the introduction. Well, I am Javier González Conde. As Alberto has presented me, I'm taking my PhD at the University of the Basque Country, and I'm also CEO of Quantum Maths. First of all, I'd like to give you an overview about what I'm talking about in this, in this seminar. First of all, I'm telling you my personal experience in both uh, academia, it is my PhD, and all the previous steps uh, through, uh, I have been uh, just to, to get this, this stage and this personal experience of entrepreneurship and become the CEO of Quantum Maths. And in the second part of the seminar, um, I'm talking about quantum computing algorithms, especially in the NISC era. I'll give you an overview of the state of the art and I'll present you uh, the algorithm that we have recently published that is an algorithm for pricing financial derivatives with a quantum computer. So let me go through the first part, my personal experience. In, in this first uh, slide, I'm showing you, which is my, my background, so let's say my CV with my experience in academia and industry. And I would like to introduce you when I received my first contacts with uh, the quantum physics and the quantum computing. It's true that my first idea about quantum computing uh, was uh, when I was in the high school, a, a teacher of mine was uh, completely uh, concerned about the importance of quantum computers in the future. Let's say it is in 2013, 2012. And then I, I uh, completed a formation uh, as a mathematician and a physician. And in this part, when I was taking my bachelor in physics, I heard about Professor Martin Delgado and also from Dr. Oscar Villola about the idea of uh, doing computation with following the, the, the laws of quantum mechanics. And it was later uh, after completing my information and when I had to decide uh, which was a topic of my master dissertation, when and just listening a seminar in the, in the University in Complutense of Madrid, in the Faculty of Physics, when I heard about mixing uh, two concepts, one of them was quantum computing and the other was machine learning. So uh, let's say that we have uh, the concept of quantum machine learning. So it was Eric Torrontegui who was working uh, on this topic uh, from FESIC and now he's a professor at University Carlos III of Madrid. And uh, he was my thesis, my master thesis director um, uh, that we elaborated in quantum machine learning. And in parallel, uh, while taking my, my master, I was working in uh, I was working at Accenture and there was when I firstly met Alberto uh, and the, the quantum project of, of Accenture. So once that I finished my master dissertation, it was uh, 2018. And uh, let me give you an overview of the situation in, in that moment. So uh, I wanted to uh, improve my formation in, in, quantum, in quantum computing so uh, there was a, a project in Madrid that was Kitemat that uh, sadly uh, finished just by the moment that I was finishing my, my master's studies. So just let me highlight some of the, of the uh, <clears throat> main researches in, involved in, in this project. We have Juanjo Garcia Repol from the SIC. I, I was uh, in touch with him just because uh, he was the the director of the group uh, of Eric Torrontegui, my, my master thesis director. I also received influence from uh, Professor uh, Martin Delgado. Uh, I also talked to um, David Perez uh, at uh, uh, Faculty of Mathematics. And I also was in touch with uh, Vicente Martin uh, at uh, University uh, Politecnica, Politecnica of Madrid. And I also, uh, she's not here, but uh, I also was in touch with uh, Dr. Uh, Veronica Fernandez Marmol, uh, who had a project about quantum cryptography, designing uh, quantum antennas. So in the end, this was uh, the, the state of the art by, by that time. Uh, so 
uh, the, the, the main problem here was that there was not a clear uh, line to continue with, with this uh, project and the, the task of finding uh, funding to, to complete my PhD, it was not something clear. Um, just because life is in that way sometimes, Eric just uh, called uh, a friend of him, uh, Dr. Mikkel Sand, uh, who was part of the one of the most famous group in Spain by then and now, which is a QT Center at the University of the Basque Country. They were based in Bilbao and they invited me to visit them and to, to explore what they were doing. And I just, uh, this summer, that summer, I just traveled to Bilbao and uh, just met all the, all the team. Uh, we, I, I'll say we are, they, they were by, by then uh, around uh, 12 people. So it's, it's uh, a very a, a wide variety of people working different topics. Uh, so the point is that I took a decision. So I started my PhD there because they had uh, all the opportunities to fund, to fund uh, my PhD thesis. And I had a lot of experts in several fields of, of, of quantum technologies. Uh, so I moved to Bilbao and decided to start it, my, my PhD thesis. So I am presenting now, which is my, my center. Uh, I belong to QT Center at the University of the Basque Country. We are based here in Bilbao, uh, in the north of Spain. And we have three main uh, researchers uh, who lead three, three groups. Uh, the first of them is the one led by Dr. Mikkel Sand, who is an Ikes Basque researcher, which is a group of quantum uh, microwave quantum technologies and architectures. We are also doing quantum computation in, in, this, in this group. We also have the group of the Dr. Jorge Casanova, who is also an Ikes Basque researcher, uh, and he um, is uh, investigating uh, in quantum sensing and control. And we also have a group of quantum optics led by Professor Sichen, who is um, <clears throat> who is also a professor uh, at the University of Shanghai, and we have um, another uh, a good partnership with another group, uh, which is uh, the Qartis Center in, at the University of Shanghai. And as a part of this group, we have collaboration with uh, different uh, institutions. Uh, for instance, we have a collaboration with Dr. Angel Rodriguez Rojas, who is in Santander Bank. Uh, in Madrid, and we also have uh, collaborations uh, with uh, the hardware uh, startup, uh, who aims to become the, the leader, the European leader in terms of hardware, quantum hardware, IQM. Um, we are involved in several projects, in several uh, projects uh, from the Ministry of Spain, also from the Basque Country, from the from the states. And, and we are part of the European flagship. We have a participation in projects such as QMIX, Open Super Q, in which I have been hired for the last uh, six months and in the European project Kiromorphic. So this is the group. And just to give you an overview of what we do, uh, I want to give you the main reference of the latest, of the latest publications. Uh, as you can see, uh, I have split uh, them in adiabatic computation and digital computation. And as you can see, we have a wide variety of, of fields. We uh, have researches in cryptography, logistic networks, finance, um, quantum artificial light, etc. In particular, I'm involved in, in the finance field. So you can find me here in these two publications. Uh, specifically, I will talk about this publication later, and I have two, two papers in preparation uh, that uh, I hope that will be published uh, within a uh, few months. So now that I have introduced you my, my center, um, I'll talk about which are my main activities as a PhD student. So in the first um, term, I have to have an active uh, researching uh, uh, activity. So, uh, we we are focused on on publishing our our best researches and those that are successfully uh, completed. So these these two are my two publication by the moment. In this one is the, the most the most written and in, in recent and 
The other one I have been included as second author. You may check it in uh, an archive, but I have to, to refresh it because it is not the, the latest version because we have introduced some changes. And also as a PhD student, uh, I have uh, I have uh, been a speaker in conference in the Marx meeting, which is one of the most important um, conferences uh, for the, I would say the, the most one for for physicians, uh, we, which takes part uh, yearly um, in the states. I also participate in conference uh, with the European projects and with uh, the center that we have and the University of Shanghai and also in other Spanish universities as. University Complutense of Madrid, and I have participated in several challenges, uh, mostly uh, the, the IBM challenges and also uh, a couple of hackathons. And I'm basing my, my thesis on quantum algorithms for finance, if you have not uh, guessed it here, uh, yet. Um, I, I am working on this topic and we'll be talking about it later. So now that I have presented you my activities, uh, in the academia, it's time to move to the industry. So I am the CEO of a startup, it is Quantum Maths. Uh, our lemma is to pioneer the quantum transition. And basically we are trying to improve the, the optimization solutions for the industry. So let me present you, which is the, the beginning of, of the startup. Um, it, uh, we will we, we'll go to, we, we'll have to go back to, to before the, the pandemic and December uh, 2019, and a hackathon took place in, in Bilbao, and we were participants, and we were proposed a challenge to generative um, artificial data series of markets just by using a quantum Boltzmann machine. So we created a solution and we presented it. Uh, I, I gave the winning talk. And eventually we won the, the first prize in the category in quantum just with our solution to this, to this challenge. So from this event, we, um, we thought about the possibility of uh, raising a startup. Just um, uh, it was uh, something that, had, that we had in mind uh, since the beginning of our PhDs, but just because we were together and we, uh, so that uh, the, the, we have the capacity uh, to work as a team, we decide to accelerate this process and found the, the and, and raise the, the startup. So this was the born of quantum maths. Uh, actually, we are 10 people. Uh, here we have the quantum core um, together with Ana, Giancarlo and, Ro and Rodrigo. We are the four PhD students in our uh, second third year of PhD. Uh, some of them, Ana and Giancarlo, will come uh, to, to give other seminars. Uh, I'll announce it later. We also have Grander Oribe and Daniel uh, in this uh, CTO, uh, CEO, and we have uh, a partnership with another enterprise as Sarate Mateo, within Systems. And we also have an excellent advisory board uh, with experts in finance and, and machine learning. So the point here, it is that uh, we are experts in several fields uh, of quantum computing. Uh, for instance, Anna is an expert in, in implementation of quantum PCAs for finance and implementation of the quantum Fourier transform, especially in a computational paradigm uh, that is uh, the digital analog uh, quantum computation. Uh, I'll talk about it later. And she will, she will come to, to, to give you a conference uh, on my 18. Uh, also, we have. Um, our quantum engineer Giancarlo Gatti, he is expert in information compression and quantum machine learning. He is also coming. I am also announcing uh, his conference. And me, who is the, the guy who is basing the, uh, his thesis in, in finance, especially uh, in pricing financial derivatives and in classes prediction. So uh, in quantum maths, basically, we have uh, several products and we are. Um, uh, developing uh, proof of concepts in finance. We have a collaboration with a local bank here in the Basque country. And we also are developing proof of concepts in terms of security, cyber security. And we um, are also um, in, in, the, in the field of uh, logistics 
and optimizing uh, op uh, delivering routes. So this is like the general scheme of, of our taxon and our partners, as you can appreciate. And basically, uh, we are hardware agnostic and we will use the best platforms. But uh, let's say that currently and nowadays, the, the quantum solution that we can provide to the industry are mostly a quantum inspired solution. Uh, and I will talk a little bit about this paradigm later. So uh, now let's go through the second part of the talk, uh, quantum computing algorithms in the NISC era. So first of all, I'd like to introduce you to quantum computers. You perfectly know why, which, what is a quantum computer, but I'd like to highlight a couple of things that are not, are not always said. Uh, the first of one, it is obviously a quantum computer has to be um, able to modify and manipulate the quantum state. It is uh, uh, <clears throat> something that is um, completely necessary. Uh, and also we need uh, to um, use the quantum properties of, of the quantum mechanics uh, to make profit of this and speed some algorithms. And the point here, it is that we only can speed some algorithms. So not every problem can be speed by a quantum computer. And also uh, the problem itself of knowing which problems can be speed up or not with a quantum computer is one of the central problems in, in mathematics because it, uh, it is related to, to the complexity classes, P and NP. So uh, we have to, to make clear that when we begin to study the, the a problem, a certain problem in quantum computing, we don't have an answer, and uh, we have we run the risk uh, to fail just because we do not find an, an optimal solution. We do not find an speed up. But I will give uh, you later a personal opinion about uh, what uh, we can we do despite we do not obtain um, a quantum advantage. And in the second part. It's important to remark that everything that it is computable with a quantum computer, uh, it is computable uh, by a classical computer. It, it is a relation in terms of mathematical equivalence. Uh, if we uh, are realistic, uh, we will need, for instance, uh, just very large times. Uh, you will know the, the paper of uh, Google in which they were performing a simulation just in, 2000, in 200 seconds. And, and they said that the classical counterpart will take uh, a, a lot of years. Um, and so the difference here, it is not in, in the mathematical formulation, it is in the number of resources, uh, time and transistors that you may need to uh, compute your problem. Uh, but they are both equivalent. So one, once that we have uh, highlighted these two properties of quantum computers, uh, the point is to uh, give you an overview. You may know most of the computers that I am presenting you here. Um, we have the, the digital paradigm, uh, the analog paradigm, and the hybrid paradigm. So let me remark just yes, in the analog paradigm, the, the possibility to do quantum computation, not with a quantum computer, with a quantum simulation. It is to use a system that can mimic the dynamics of a desired problem. So for instance, I am developing a solution for pricing financial derivatives, just using a trap uh, ion to mimic this, 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 this problem, whose, whose dynamic can mimic the problem to solve, which is black souls dynamics. Uh, and let me introduce you um, a paradigm, which is the digital analog quantum computation, uh, uh, who has been, what, what, that, that, that has been Consider about IQM, and it is one of the main uh, researching branches in terms of quantum hardware. And they bet to to be uh, one of the hardwares in the mid term. It is in the next three, four, five years. So let me introduce you all briefly, uh, which is the the concept behind uh, the digital analog. It is basically uh, an annealer in which we introduce some logical gates. Uh, that belong to, to digital computation. So it is a mixture uh, between digital and, and annealing. And it is universal, but it has some, some, some pros and, and disadvantages with respect to, to digital computation. 
And also, obviously, we have uh, the, the quantum spherical computation, uh, which is uh, what we can uh, use without any kind of uh, error in terms of decoherence or um, error correcting in terms of measuring the qubits, because it is everything uh, simulated by a classical computer, but it can bring a great value to the, to the industry today. So uh, once that I have given you this the overview, I like to go through the algorithms that run that are running these computers. So I am presenting you here the most uh, common model for a quantum algorithm, which, uh, which is the input uh, process and output model. So we have an input data, we have a, a quantum processing uh, of information, uh, and we have an information retrieval, and that's everything. So let me remark two points here that are not often said. Uh, the first one it is how to measure the complexity of the algorithms. So the complexity of the algorithms, it, it is important that it is the number of non parallels, parallels, mostly the entangling gates in terms of the number of qubits. So if we can run uh, uh, two qubit gates in parallel, we only will have into account the, 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 the longest uh, sequence or in terms of depth of the circuit. And also another consideration, which is usually ignored, which is that the complexity of the algorithms uh, correspond uh, to the worst part of the algorithms. It is, if you have an algorithm in which you use a, um, quantum amplitude estimation uh, and it provides you a quadratic speed up, uh, if you then need to do a retrieval of information, which is exponential, uh, despite you have this uh, quadratic sp speed up in the data processing, uh, you cannot claim that your algorithm, it is uh, providing you an a quadratic speed up with respect to classical ones. So to this kind of algorithms that uh, provide us only efficiency in a determined part of the algorithm, we call it quantum superteams. For instance, we have the quantum Fourier transform. Quantum Fourier transform, quantum Fourier transform it's quite useful because uh, it is efficient in the data processing uh, because it has a complexity of, of order uh, polynomial in terms of, of the number of gates in the number of qubits uh, in, comparison, in comparison with, with the classical counterpart, which is exponential. So as a part of a largest algorithm, uh, usually it is used to change from position to momentum basis, it is efficient. But if we will try to retrieve the information of producing a quantum Fourier transform to an initial state, we will need to, will need to, to perform a complete tomography of the, final, of the final state, so it will not be efficient. And on the other hand, there are another models which are, which are not as simple as uh, loading the quantum data, processing the quantum data and uh, retrieve the quantum information that are hybrid and, I in, are, and are integrated uh, with classical uh, computation. For instance, we have uh, those that are integrating with high performance computing that are, for instance, the, 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 the variational quantum agent solver that uh, some uh, processes are calculated by using the quantum computer, but the optimization is done classically. So this will be another scheme of algorithm that is hybrid with a, with a classical uh, computer. So these are the two paradigms. So let me go, uh, let me analyze uh, this part of data information and loading and this part of information retrieval because in the most cases, I don't know if it is intentional or not, or, or this is because it's too trivial. This is ignored in most of uh, publications and algorithms, or at least it's not too clear and too, um, uh, and too uh, explicit. So let me go through, through, the, um, through an analysis of, of these two processes. Well, the first of them, it is the information loading. It is the quantum state preparation. So in the 80, 90% of the cases, uh, this, this can be done with three different ways. The first, the, the first way it is uh, to perform an amplitude codification. It is to code information in the amplitude of the quantum 
eigen states. Uh, so it provides us an exponential compression uh, because with only n qubits, we'll have two to the n uh, eigen, eigen amplitudes corresponding to the two to the n uh, eigen states. But the point here, it is that usually going from the initial state of a quantum computer, that usually it is all zeros, uh, to the desired state requires to implement a unitary transformation that cannot be done efficiently in the general case and has an exponential cost. So it's not optimal unless that you have uh, the proper method or a specific case for which you know which is the optimal implementation. The second way to, to, to prepare our, our state, it is to use vector codification in which we don't have vector codification, we don't have a, um, an exponential compression. In fact, we don't have compression and we, and we do the equivalence among a, a classical vector and a classical and a quantum state. So here, the point is that, for instance, if we are trying to run the algorithm, we'll be able to run in parallel the algorithm uh, over different inputs, but uh, not, uh, uh, not over a mess of a superposition of a state representing a whole. Um, in the third case, we'll have uh, the unary codification emission data. So in this case, we have uh, emission matrix here. And what we load in the quantum algorithm as the initial state, usually it is the exponential, uh, the unitary co corresponding to the exponential of this emission matrix. So it is a common method used in quantum machine learning. And we can split uh, this into two cases. The first one, it is when the matrix that we are considering, it is sparse. Uh, so we have here the result of Dominic Berry uh, and his collaborators. Um, and the other, uh, 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 sorry, um, the, the, here the, the result warranties uh, us um, an error in terms of the sparsity. And, and in the other, in the other hand, uh, on the other hand, we have uh, an alternative uh, in which we also have to to ask to the matrix to be positive. It is to determine. Uh, a quantum a quantum state to, to be a, a density matrix and we can generate n copies uh, we we need eight n copies of the matrix a and, and in this case it does it does not have to be sparse and it is this this method it is presented in the paper of quantum uh, pca of cell Lloyd and you can find an, an error uh, which the case with the, with the exponentially with the number of copies of, of the matrix. Um, so now that I have presented which are the, the, the ways to load the initial state in the, in the quantum computer, it is uh, time to, to look at uh, the information retrieval process in which we uh, have the first limitation, which is the Hollebo bond. Uh, that uh, establish that if we have a, a system with n qubits, uh, despite that we can create a superposition of two to the n uh, against states at two to the n amplitudes, uh, once that we are measuring, uh, we only can retrieve n classical bits. So this is one of the main limitations of the information retrieval, that with each measurement, we only can retrieve n, um, n bits. And the point here, it is that unless the information that we want to retrieve uh, requires um, uh, just to measure uh, a, a part of, of the final state or not to solve the, the whole problem, uh, the retrieval, it is not efficient because if we uh, need, uh, if it is required to, to measure uh, the full uh, final state of the system, uh, we'll need to perform a full tomography uh, to know the classical state, the classical information, and it has an exponential cost. So an example of this is it is that uh, when we have the HHL algorithm to solve uh, systems of equations that appears naturally, uh, for instance, when we are trying to solve a partial differential equation and we are using a method of uh, finite uh, of uh, finite volumes or 
um, finite difference, we, we have uh, 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 system equations in which we have several uh, unknown variables. And the point here is that if you if we use this this algorithm to to determine all the unknown variables of the of the system, we'll have uh, not an, an speed up because we have an exponential cost in terms of me of measure all the variables. But for instance, if we only know to to if we only need to know uh, a few unknown variables or a function of these variables, it can be efficiently done and we can uh, recover it with an exponential um, speed up with respect to a classical method because we are not using the the, um, the advantage in the data processing with information retrieval. So now that I have presented you which are the main two bottlenecks in terms of quantum algorithms, which are the loading and retrieval of information, uh, we need uh, to, to, to ask ourselves this question, which is, uh, if we have, if we not, do not have a quantum speed up, uh, is it useful for the industry or it is completely useless? So I'm going to ask this question uh, just following all the, um, the summary that has uh, done Dr. Mikkel San, who is the one that has been collecting all these answer to the bottlenecks and perspective on, of these uh, algorithms in the NISC era. So everything uh, uh, is thanks to him. And the first point here, it is that uh, this property of quantum speed up, it is not totally necessary, uh, but, um, uh, we would like to, to, to have it. So in case that we do not have it, uh, because uh, physicians uh, always try to, to get an exponential speed up or a quadratic speed up. So let's say that we only have a small factor uh, of, of the performance of our algorithms. It is uh, that our, our algorithm takes the half time to perform the solution of the of the problem that we want to solve only a factor two, so it is enough for the for the market. It is enough for the industry. So theoretically, theoretically, we are trying to to find the the best advantages and to do it everything uh, in an analytical way. But in the in the practice, uh, we can just um, obtain. Uh, a, a great advantage just yes, by a simple factor of two. On the other hand, despite we do not have any kind of factor advantage, it is the, the algorithm have the same um, um, the same complexity order. So we are in a situation in which uh, just performing the calculations in a quantum computer, it is uh, it means an advantage in terms of the energy cost, uh, especially when we are comparing it to the supercomputings uh, in terms of a high performance computing. Uh, here, I want to give you an example of, which is uh, the most uh, uh, powerful supercomputers, uh, specifically the, the most powerful, it is uh, from Fujitsu, which is supercomputer Fugaku. And the power that this computer needs, it is, uh, around 29 megawatts. So it means that uh, it's uh, consuming terms of power. It is similar or in the same order of what a middle size uh, nuclear power plant, in this case, the, the recently dismantled um, nuclear power plant of Garoña here in Spain uh, produced, uh, which was around uh, 450 megawatts. So its um, energy cost is comparable to the one uh, provided by a power plant, a power plant while uh, the, the power consume for a quantum computer will be in the order of a few uh, uh, kilo, kilowatts. So it is a reason to use a quantum computer to solve the problem. And in the, in the last, um, uh, in the last uh, part, I'd like to, to go through to this perspective of, uh, especially for the machine learning in which uh, we can just uh, combine a machine learning algorithm to, together with a quantum sensor, uh, hence the information that we obtain from the quantum sensor 
does not need to be uh, retrieved and read classically, and we can directly uh, keep everything in the quantum mechanics formulation in the in the in the quantum mechanics uh, um, wave function, and directly we can transmit information from the sensor to the algorithm, and then we are saving uh, the retrieval and information uh, loading. So this may be um, something that that uh, provides a positive prospect in terms problems. So now that I have given you an state of the art uh, perspective, uh, I'd like to present you uh, our uh, recent job, our recent uh, research, our recent paper. Um, we are the four authors of this paper, which is pricing financial derivatives with quantum speed up. So let me go through through the through the presentation of, of my algorithm. So in the first step, we'll have to understand which is the problem that we are solving with um, with the quantum algorithm, which is the problem of uh, pricing options. So what is an option? An option is a contract that gives you a right to sell or buy certain asset uh, on a specific future date. It is, for instance, imagine that this is the, the market and this is the price of, of the Apple stock. And we are in January 2019 and the price is 150 and we uh, have a good prediction uh, about the future. And we may consider that uh, it is going to triplicate the value. So, well, imagine that we have not enough cash to buy stocks or we don't want to run the risk directly. So one possibility here, it is to buy the option to buy, to, to, to buy the Apple stocks within uh, one year and a half uh, per 150 euros. So if we have this, this right in the, in the future, we can buy options per 150 and sell it uh, in the, at the, per the market price that will be 450 and we will be generating a profit of 300 euro or dollar. So the point here it is that um, there exist uh, many different types of, of options depending on the conditions uh, at uh, the time of um, uh, just uh, 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 sorry, just to uh, exert the the, the the to execute your right of of uh, buying or selling. So we have a European option, we have uh, Asian option, uh, we have American options, and in this case we are focused only on pricing European options. So. Just to understand the problem, which is the formulation behind uh, this, this, this concept of pricing, we are going to suppose that we have a stochastic process of the uh, asset that is underlying to the contract that gives you the right. So this is going to follow a stochastic process uh, that can be interpreted as a, a normal Gaussian distribution. Uh, which is uh, the geometric um, Brownian motion. And just following this hypothesis together with the Ito's lemma, uh, we can um, express the value of this contract. It is, uh, we uh, are going to buy a right, but someone has to be uh, the one that is guaranteeing that you will have this right and, and this, this bank or institution that is selling us this right will have to warranty that they have no losses because they are uh, giving free money for, for, for the buyers. So the point here, it is that we can express this, this value of the option by using the Eto's lemma and the, the people that is uh, just uh, warranting uh, the right in the future uh, can follow a Delta hedge portfolio strategy under some assumptions on the market, uh, for instance, constant volatility, constant interest rate, and efficient markets, and just warranty that the term in the evolution of the price of the ocean, uh, depending on the on the stochastic uh, process, can be uh, eliminated, and we only remain 
with the risk-free term, it is the, 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 the term of the neutral risk elements of the market, the, typically the, the bonds. So following this, uh, we can derive uh, the, the black soul parcel differential equation, depending on the uh, financial parameters, uh, plus a payoff condition which determines which is which are your your uh, which are your which is your profit by the moment that you um, execute your your right to sell or buy. In this case, we have the the, the put option. We have the, the sell to to buy or buy. We, we are we are not selling, and this is a, parab a parabolic partial differential equation. And can be this, this problem can be tackled for, from two different perspectives, and we can solve the stochastic differential equation. So there are uh, several previous attempts. So I'd like to highlight the, the most um, the most known, which is the one um, done by by Stefan Bernier and and his his colleagues, uh, which is uh, which consists in using quantum Monte Carlo simulations to solve the stochastic differential equation. And just because quantum Monte Carlo simulations are done by using the quantum amplitude estimation, they have a quadratic speed up. And this formulation, it is equivalent to through the ethos lemma to the partial differential equation formulation that I am presenting you here. And we are going to solve this partial differential equation through Hamiltonian simulation. And we are reporting an exponential speed up and I will highlight all the parts of the algorithm in terms of loading information, processing information, and information retrieval uh, to ensure that we are just um, keeping the exponential speed. So the, the first point here to solve the partial differential equation, it is that we have an initial value problem. Uh, we have the, the equation plus the, the condition at the maturity time, and that gives us the profit. So First of all, we need physical variables. So through this change of variable, we obtain this equation that we can now rewrite as a Schrodinger equation. And through this time reversion and the definition of the momentum operator, we can obtain, which is the uh, black Scholes Hamiltonian of the, of the equation in this Schrodinger formulation, which has an Hermitian and an anti-Hermitian part. So, um, because the Hamiltonian it is not Hermitian, its propagator it is not unitary, and it cannot be directly implemented in a quantum computer. So we need a solution for this. So we have to uh, load the initial state, perform the non-Hermitian dynamics, and then retrieve the information to solve the partial differential equation plus the uh, initial condition. So essentially, we are solving an initial value problem. So let me give you an overview of the, of the algorithm. So first of all, we have the Schrodinger, uh, the black source Schrodinger equation. So the first step is to digitalize it. Uh, and we have an amplitude uh, codification, and, uh, as I have uh, presented you before, which means an exponential compression in the quantum computer. And then we have the part of the data processing. So in this part, once that we have initialized our circuit, we are using the quantum Fourier subroutine to perform a change of basis from the uh, space to the momentum basis. And then we simulate the dynamics of the Hamiltonian, the Hermitian and anti-Hermitian part. And then we uh, just uh, do the inverse Fourier transform to come back to the position space. And in the end, we will measure the uh, information. So we have an efficient loading of the initial state. We have an efficient subroutine, which is the quantum Fourier transform. We have an efficient dynamic simulation through truncation of the non-important terms of the Hamiltonian. And we have an information, an efficient information retrieval. So in the end, because we have an efficient exponential compression, we have a polynomial depth in terms of number of gates, and we have an efficient information retrieval, we have an exponential speed up with respect to a classical algorithm. So let me go through all the steps. The first step, it is to digitalize the position and momentum operator in which we have formulated our equation. So uh, we have here, which is the chosen uh, discretization 
uh, in the uh, uh, position basis. And as you can see, one of the problems here it is to determine which are going to be the boundary condition for the momentum operators. So uh, the point here, it is that because of we are using n qubits, we will have a grid of two to the n uh, uh, points that uh, will be the, in, uh, the points in which we are solving the, the, the equation. And we have chosen to duplicate the initial uh, condition of the, of the initial value problem just to establish the, establish the simulation. And it only requires an additional uh, qubit to, to double the, the support. And hence, because we are duplicating the initial condition, we can choose periodic boundary condition. And this is something completely uh, fundamental for our work. It is the key of this, because thanks that we have chosen this boundary condition, this matrix become a circular matrix and hence it can be diagonalized by the quantum Fourier transform. Otherwise, if I had chosen here, for instance, a zero and here uh, another zero, it will not be circular. And we would not know which is the implementation, the optimal implementation of the matrix which diagonalize our matrix. So now that we have discretized uh, the, the momentum and the space, we have to load the initial state. Basically, this is the quantum initial state that we have to load. And it corresponds to, to this function, which is log concave. Uh, and we have a result that guarantees that it is efficiently implementable, just uh, following these results of Christa, so uh, of, of Christa Sofal uh, and Stephen Wagner, uh, with um, guarantees that using a quantum generated adversarial network, uh, we can generate the desired uh, probability distribution. Uh, a quantum linearity adversarial network, it is basically a scheme of machine learning in which we have a parameterized uh, quantum circuit that provides synthetic data and we introduce it in a classical discriminator together with real data from the distribution that we want to load and it, cl and it classifies uh, whether the the data it is real or, or synthetic. And in the end, when we reach the equilibrium of the training, uh, the generator is able to produce the, the, the real distribution, so uh, the real density function. So once that we have loaded it efficiently following this result, we have the point of uh, solving the problem of the non-emission uh, Hamiltonian. We have a non-emission dynamics. So what we are doing to solve this problem, it is to embed the propagator of the non-emission Hamiltonian. So this is the propagator of the anti-emission part of the black soul's Hamiltonian. And we are just embedded it into an enlarged operator, which is unitary. And just by reformulating it, rewriting it at the exponential of an operator, we obtain what we call the embed Hamiltonian, which correspond to the arc cosine of the propagator of the initial Hamilton. And this can be efficiently done just by using, by using only one ancillary qubit. So in the end, because we have enlarged our system, we'll have certain probability to collapse in the desires of the space when measuring our final state, because as you can appreciate, uh, this is the, the part of the um, ancillary qubit, and this is the part in which we have engulfed our initial state of the payoff condition of black souls. And when evolving it, we will have some part uh, with um, the desired evolution. And we'll have another part with uh, the terms corresponding to the, to the embedding. So in general, we have to analyze which is going to be the success probability to collapse in this first part and recover the dynamics of the black souls Hamiltonian. And this probability for a wide range of financial parameters, it is about uh, 60%. So it is something completely efficient. So now that we have uh, clear, which is the protocol uh, that we are using to tackle this problem of non-emission Hamiltonian, we need to uh, uh, just uh, implement in terms of gate, the dynamics of these two Hamiltonian, which is the 
uh, Hamiltonian of the Hermitian part of Laxos and the embed Hamiltonian. So because uh, this two Hamiltonian only depend on momentum operator, we have seen before that quantum Fourier transform can diagonalize it, uh, the momentum operator. So we can write it in the momentum basis in the, in the diagonal form. And then we rewrite these Hamiltonians by using the poly matrices. Just because these Hamiltonians are diagonal in the momentum basis, we will only need uh, the identity and the sigma set and the sigma set matrices. And in this chain of bases uh, appears the, the Bowles function, which will give us the, the chains uh, between the projector bases and the Cartan subalgebra basis, which consists in the tensor product of identity identities and, and sigma set operators. So the point here, it is that we can analytically sum this, uh, this coefficients uh, in the Hermitian case, and we can obtain an asymptotic result in the case of the non Hermitian on the embed Hamiltonian, which contains the non Hermitian Hamiltonian. So um, once that we uh, know which are the terms uh, of the Cartan algebra subbasis, just give me, let me give you how to translate them to gates. So because it only has sigma sets and identities, all of these terms commute, and we can, cal uh, we can uh, calculate the evolution uh, splitting uh, uh, the, uh, the, the propagator in a sequence of operators of these forms that in terms of gate can be implemented as this. So the point here, it is that uh, the, the, oops, let this, and a slide missing, I don't know why. Let me, well, no problem. I'll say it here. There's a point here that uh, if all the terms that we are considering when rewriting this uh, Hamiltonian in the Cartan basis are meaningful or not, uh, if all of them are relevant or not. Here we have, which is the sum of these coefficients, and we can observe that uh, these coefficients in the Cartan algebra subbasis decays exponentially, decay exponentially, and then we can perform a truncation of the less relevant, and we can obtain an error associated to this truncation, which is uh, exponentially upper bound uh, by the number of terms um, uh, consider in the in the truncation. So here we propose a solution uh, for the case in which we have a qubit to encode the solution of the Black Scholes um, partial differential equation. H qubit will mean uh, uh, 126 points. Uh, no, two, 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 256 points, but. Uh, because we are using one of them to duplicate the condition, or only 126. Uh, so the point here, it is that uh, with respect to all the terms that we will obtain in the decomposition uh, in the Pauli basis, that will be one, 126, we will only use the first, uh, the largest 14 terms for the emission case, and the largest six terms for the um, embed term, and here you can appreciate which is the solution for the approximated um, Hamiltonian uh, with the truncation and the analytical solution uh, for the um, uh, black source partial differential equation. And you can appreciate that it is uh, more uh, than enough accurate just to the problem that we want to solve. So, now, the point one that we have been able to implement the, the, the dynamics, uh, we uh, need to retrieve the information. And just because the nature of the problem that we are solving, we only need to um, recover the information in a few points around the, the strike price. Um, and we only need the information in a tiny quantity of points. So we can efficiently measure the PUBMs associated to, to these points, uh, which, I did, which are this, uh, avoiding to perform a full tomography as I have indicated before. So this can um, uh, complete 
the, the algorithm. So we have the exponential compression. We have a polynomial number of gates because we can truncate the, the decomposition of the Hamiltonian in the Pauli basis. And we can uh, retrieve efficiently the information and so we have a quantum speed. -up. And just to give you a detail on how to efficiently measure the PUBM, it is as simple as using the ancillary qubit that we had used before to implement the, the, the embedding uh, or any other ancillary qubit that we have used to implement the gates, just to perform multi-control qubit gates uh, for the case that we want to, to know, and just measuring the, uh, the just one single qubit of all that we have to obtain the solution to, to know which is the value, which is the amplitude of this, of this state. So here you have a simulation of uh, which is the, the precision of, which is the, which, sorry, which is the accuracy of the quantum solution uh, as uh, we increment the number of qubits in the, in the grid. So you can observe that it is uh, good enough with eight qubits. And here we have a, a, a comparison with, um, with a classical method, with a classical survey which is Karl Nicholson solver. And you can appreciate that uh, for less than uh, 1,000 points, Karl Nicholson uh, error is uh, lower than the quantum simulation. But from this point, due to uh, Karl Nicholson has to discretize both uh, position and time, uh, quantum solution improves the, the classical performance of the so uh, uh, solver. And in the end, there is an open question, which is the, the loading of the initial condition, because uh, we have presented uh, a protocol to load it by using quantum generative adversarial networks, and it requires to try uh, the generative adversarial networks. Uh, but there is an alternative, uh, which is uh, given by, Law, by Grover and Rudolf, uh, who guarantees that if there are some conditions on the, the distribution probability that we want to load, we, it, can don't, it can be done efficiently. But they ensure it in, in, in the sense of existence, but they do not provide a constructive way to get this, um, this circuit to implement efficiently the initial state. So uh, this will be the circuit that they propose uh, in, in terms of gates, which has an exponentially um, quantity of entangling gates. And we are working to obtain a better implementation with, an exponent, with a polynomial number of gates that improves uh, the, the, the method given by, by Robert and Robert. So let me give you some con conclusions and an ad hoc. So in this algorithm, we have that we have given a polynomial number of gates, uh, and we have uh, an accurate enough solution. Hence, taking into account the, 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 the loading and the retrieval of information, we have an exponential speed up with respect to classical methods to solve partial differential equation. We have uh, applied this to one of the toy models in finance, which is the black souls model. Uh, we have benchmark this, 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 this protocol and this algorithm in the simplest model. And we are aiming to, to apply this to more complex pricing problems. For example, couple options introduce a stock and time dependent volatilities or models uh, like uh, Hydro uh, Jero Morton or Merton Garman models, etc. We have a wide um, uh, aspect of possibilities. And in the end, because we are in the NISC era, uh, we have that finance and economy are uh, one of the fields in which we have the most promising applications of near terms quantum computers. Uh, however, we have to design a specific solution to a specific problems and adapt them because we are in the NISC era and we still not, not have a full tolerant computer as as is our case, we have proposed a solution that only requires 10 qubits. That is something that is not too far uh, from uh, reality um, in opposite of the, the algorithms proposed, for instance, using a quantum amplitude estimation that requires uh, a, lot of, a lot of qubits. 
So this is all. Um, thank you very much for your attention. Um, if you have any question, I'll, it will be a pleasure to answer. Yes, thank you very, very much, Javi, for my, for my side. I think it has been a very interesting session. And But if you allow me, I would like to answer you a few questions because yeah. I have did a bit of homework, to be honest. <laughs> well, you speak about the quantum simulation you did for your algorithm. You speak regarding the, uh, the comparison with, with the classical one. But how is the noise of the real quantum computer affecting your algorithm? Well, uh, by the moment, we have not uh, run the algorithm in a real hardware. It is everything simulated by using okay. that uh, MATLAB and the, the simulator of, of IBM, but without introducing noise. We are working in a real case, uh, just using, instead of eight qubits, that it is the solution that we propose, just using less, a le, a less uh, quantity of qubits, that will be around five, six qubits. So we'll have results about the real implementation in hardware soon, but uh, we hope that because the number of gates that we need to implement it, which is around a uh, hundred gates uh, to perform the data processing, will not have uh, a, a too excessive uh, problem with nodes and the coherence uh, due to the depth of the liquid that we need to run in the computer. Okay, but, because uh, of the fission. Yeah, yeah, uh, uh, that's it. We, we don't have too much qubits and we don't have too much gates. Right. Obviously, we will we'll have an impact of noise, but uh, it can be run in a, in a NISC device. Yeah, it can be affordable. Okay, perfect. And one question that arises to me when I, when I proposed you to this session was like, what is the the main difficulties, the main that you are uh, that you are facing when you are constructing the the algorithm is to say, what for you, what is the most difficult part of that? You are in mute, Javier. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, first of all, let me uh, tell you that this is an algorithm which implies uh, knowledge of finance, knowledge of mathematics, and knowledge of quantum physics. So let's say that one of the first states here, it is to understand the, the, the complexity of the problems in, in all the fields. So from, from the financial problems, uh, which is the, the formulation, the, the different formulation of black Scholes problem, the stochastic uh, approach, the partial differential approach, then uh, to understand which are the possibilities uh, to, 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 um, to solve the problem of the non-emission dynamics, and specifically, one of the most challenging points here, it was to obtain the analytical expressions for the, for the error. It is one of the, of the things that struggle me the most, um, just because the, 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 the mathematical uh, complexity of, of this task. Perfect. Thank you very much, Javi. That's, that's, that were very questions. Well, does anyone have, uh, do anyone Hello. has? Oh, yes, absolutely, perfect. Yeah. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, yeah, so I have a couple of questions. Uh, I, I want to first ask uh, a few clarifying questions. So uh, so when you are implementing this algorithm, what is the end state of, I mean, you are predicting the option price or you are predict the, predicting the difference between uh, uh, what, the, what is the correct price and between what you are predicting? I mean, what is the final, final thing that you are predicting right now using this uh, implementation? Well, let, let me clarify this if I have understood you. Uh, here, uh, I have um, been a little bit fast uh, just explaining this, but here, let's say that I'm the bank and, and you, you are buying me an option. So yeah. by, by the moment that you uh, are executing your right to buy or sell uh, uh, per a certain price that we call the struct price, and mm -hmm. I have to warranty myself that I am not losing uh, so okay. when I am selling you this, this option, this right to buy and sell behind, right. I have to guarantee that I have this product uh, mm. uh, before that you claim it. And this is the, 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 the hedging strategy. It is imagine that now the, the market price, it is 
150 and you have the right to 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 buy it uh, within three months so now right. i buy it per 150 and in case that the market increase the price i keep these products because mm -hmm. i will have bought it per 150 that could be the quantity per which you will buy it in the future and um, if, if the market uh, decreases the price of this of this asset, I will sell right. it because I'm not interested because you are not going to buy it, obviously, because the market price is going to be uh, lower than the one that we have stipulated. Right. Right. So in the end, and the point here, it is that there is a risk associated to this because of the nature of the market. So I have right. to, to, to perform a hedging strategy to, to, to contemplate the possibilities of the market. So this, is, this, this runs a risk, and this risk is that we are trying to estimate and price uh, with uh, the, the black source model. Apart from yes. this, we also have a premium, which is the quantity that I, as a bank, uh, I'm charging you because I am selling you this product. So the final, when you, when you buy an option, uh, you can split uh, the purchase of this option into two parts. One is the sure. premium of me as bank and the other it is uh, the the part of of the hedging of the uh, uh, of the part of warranting that i am not using uh, because i can't guarantee you the the, the buy uh, buying or, or selling price so i don't know right. if, um, I, if i have explained myself and answer you no question. no yeah this makes sense so what i'm what i'm again trying to ask is basically let's say if i uh, miss following your example only right if I go to a bank and I uh, I, I, I basically try, I try to buy a buy buy an option at hundred dollars, right? Your model will predict whether hundred dollars is right or not, correct? Is my understanding correct? Yeah, yeah. The point is that uh, the bank has to guarantee that once that you uh, want to, to to buy it, you can uh, execute your 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 right. Uh, I'll have to to fulfill our agreement. So uh, right. you you are buying this right, and how I manage to offer you this right? It is the delta hedging strategy. Okay, and uh, I, I saw there's some there's some machine learning uh, algorithm also you have implemented in this implementation, right? There's some machine learning also uh, implemented in this implementation, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, sure. And so, uh, what is the what is the training data that you have used for this? I mean, have you used any training data for this also? Well, in 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 these terms, uh, for the for the uh, machine learning uh, mm -hmm. process that we are using, it is only for loading the initial state. So we have chosen some um, realistic financial parameters, which are the volatility, the risk-free interest rate and the strike price, we have fixed uh, them just following the advice of Angel Rodriguez Rojas of Banco Santander. Uh, mm -hmm. The point of the, in, in our part, the machine learning, it only consists in loading the initial state. So this, the data set that we have to load, it is, we have a, we have a function. Uh, okay. uh, first of all, we normalize the function to, 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 to have an area of one under the function. And then we discretize this function and artificially we produce samples of this as if it were um, a, a, a probability distribution. So with samples of the function that we want to load, with all of these samples, we introduce them to the, to the quantum, let me go through the slide, through the, through the quantum generative adversarial network. And, and then, uh, the, then the, the network learns uh, which is the the function that we have discretized and and we have a sample so this is the point there's no the data set to 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 to, to introduce in the in the generator it is it is it is not in the in the in the kugan in the discriminator this real data it consists mm -hmm. on having this this function discretize it and right. Sampling it classically and then introduce it to the to the uh, quantum linear adversarial network. And this real data is, is time series, right? Is a is kind of time series data. Sorry? This real data is, is, is a time series data. 
I don't know. Uh, so, so time series, I mean, uh, it varies from point T to let's say T, uh, T plus N, right? Uh, uh, or is it, it's a uh, what kind of data is? It? Can you explain what is the real data? What do you mean by real data here? Yeah. So what what is the real data here? What do you mean by real data? Well, in, in data, the data that we need to perform the algorithm. Yeah. What is this data? Real data. No, the, the real data we have chosen it just following the advice of of of, of Angel Rodriguez Rosa. So the real data here, just coming back to the to the algorithm, it is the 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 risk free interest rate, the volatility, mm -hmm. and the the maturity time, but and the also the the, the strike price of the option. But there is no further um, data that you need. I mean, you don't need historical data. For, for this task. And also the prediction that you obtain when pricing an option with um, with black souls, it's quite far from reality because it uh, it's considering some assumptions of the market that are not real. So the, the volatility, it is not constant. The risk free interest, it is not constant. constant. The market mm -hmm. are not efficient. There exists an arbitrage. So right. uh, let's say that we have not, we, we don't need to use uh, more data than than a real case that would be, for instance, the the the, the Apple the Apple stocks on certain uh, volatility, certain risk free interest. Now, for instance, I I, I think that the the risk free interest of the American bond it is around one point eight percent. I'm not yeah. sure. So just by using this this real data, we can simulate it. But uh, the, the data that we introduced in this uh, quantum machine learning protocol, it is not uh, market data. It is just data that we can generate with the function that okay. we put into the, into, okay. the, into the algorithm. So, sorry, one, just one last question. Uh, what, is the, what is the loss function that you have used in this implementation? The, the sorry, the last? Loss function in this machine learning implementation. Oh, okay, loss function, yeah. Uh, usually, uh, we have the one that um, that is proposed into in the uh, SOFAL uh, paper. I think it's uh, cross entropy. So you have to okay. define uh, a function which has uh, a, a combined cost between uh, the generator and the discriminator. So you get a nice equilibrium in which uh, there is a 50-50, let's say. So usually the most common uh, function to train the Genati adversarial network, it is uh, this, this uh, cross entropy function. Okay, got it, thank you. Thank you. Perfect, then I think Carlos has a question as well. He has right your, his hand. Hi, uh, thank you for the nice seminar, Javier. So I have a kind of common question, uh, see if uh, what I'm thinking is right. So you are choosing the black, uh, the black souls model because it has an analytical solution, right? And that allows you to bound the error. Is, is that correct? Uh, so so yeah. you need the, the analytical solution to bound the error or you can bound the error even if you don't have the analytical solution? The, the error bound that we have obtained here it is with respect to consider all the terms in the Hamiltonian. It is when I decompose the Hamiltonian into the uh, Pauli basis, if I would consider all the terms, I'll uh, obtain a solution that theoretically only incurs in the discretization error. Because the number of points... Uh, but that, that's okay, but that's because you already know that there is a, a solution and you can compute that solution analytically in the Black Souls model, Black Souls model directly, right? So you need the, uh, I mean, uh, I, this is just uh, to know if, how extendable the proof of the error bound is to other models where you don't have an analytical solution of the model, like no. the Hugh Jarrett Morton. In this case, or, the error bound, it is, the truncation against the, the consider the, to consider all the terms. So it is not related to the analytical uh, solution of black source. Okay, so okay, so the error, the error bound, it's independent of, of having an analytical solution. I see. Okay. Yeah, Good. having an analytical solution. Oh, so allow they, us. Yes. 
Okay. And then uh, what is the purpose of choosing, uh, I mean, the black source model in the sense that uh, this is from the point of view of the simulations, this is the less interesting model uh, as it's the one that can, one can solve analytically. So <laughs> yeah, the, the point here, uh, why not choose a more difficult one, let's say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the point here, it is that um, first of all, uh, we were developing this algorithm. So that it is something completely new. There's no previous reference. And the point here, it is that uh, this is the base. And then we, have, we are building more complex models from this model, it is more complex models are uh, uh, deeper, uh, uh, more complex black source model. It is when we, for instance, introduce a volatility depending on time and stock price, we'll have the stochastic local volatility model. So uh, if we uh, may introduce here the new degrees of freedom of volatility, or for instance, we assume that there is a stochastic uh, differential equation for the volatility, uh, we'll have to uh, define more operators, more quantum operators. So here there are several points uh, that are keys um, in terms of how an efficient algorithm. Uh, one of them, for instance, it is that the equation only depends on momentum. So if the equation would not depend on, on momentum, as I have here, uh, if we may introduce a position operator, we will lose the advantage of the diagonalization through the quantum Fourier transform subroutine. So uh, we will need to explore, and we are exploring, uh, how to introduce, for instance, a volatility depending on the position. So it will mean that we will have a position um, a, a cross term position operator, position momentum operator in the Hamiltonian. So it will increase uh, the difficulty to implement our Hamiltonian. So the point of uh, choosing this, it is because we always uh, begin with the toy model and develop the solution and then try to uh, uh, introduce more degrees of complexity in the algorithm and to scale it to, to face more, more complex models. And also, and also because we wanted to know which is the which will be the the solution with respect to the analytical solution in the case that we were um, considering uh, the uh, all the terms of the Hamiltonian. It is that uh, if I only consider the error uh, that I incur when I am uh, disc discretizing the, the momentum and space and how far is it from, from the analytical solution, which is the point that I have so here in, the, in, this, in this slide. And here you can observe, which is, which is the difference between the solution that you think considering all the, all the terms in, with four, five, six, eight, seven, eight qubits with respect to the analytical solution. So you think that the numerical approach, it is good enough with only eight qubits. So it is something more, more than surprising because it is, does not mean too much. It, it will be 252 uh, points in, in the grid. So that, that's very good. So these are the reasons to, to choose the, the black source model because we can compare it the, the numerical error and because uh, it is the more basic uh, model. And uh, from this model, we can build more complicated uh, models. Okay, I, 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 I mean, I agree. I could have done the same. It's not that uh, that uh, <laughs> I was criticizing. It's that I wanted to uh, learn from you the reasons that, that you do it this way because I think it's good for the students, and um, <clears throat> also um, because okay. um, just one thing. So as you correct were, me if just... I'm wrong. Then if you, yeah, you would just have yeah. one minute. So I mean, like this. Okay. <laughs> Yes, okay, but so of course, it's very interesting, just, everything. Just a very vast question. So then if you uh, change the, the equation and um, make some functions or some coefficients depending on time, such as volatility or, or the interest rate or whatever, then the complexity uh, scales up and then you need a larger number of qubits, I guess, right? Or well, complexity in time, 
Complexity in time, it is not a problem because uh, it only means an average value in time. The, the problem it is uh, the dependence in, in, in position because it will mean to uh, find an optimal way to implement the uh, dynamics of the Hamiltonian. So this, this is the main problem because here we have an efficient implementation because the Hamiltonian can be easily diagonalized and then we have uh, the implementation of a diagonal unitary operator. If the operator is not diagonal, it means that when, when the composite in the poly basis will have x, y, and z terms, these terms do not commune uh, among them, and we have to incur into trotter uh, process. We have to, to trotter uh, the, the, the evolution of the system, so it will mean uh, an, um, uh, to increase the, the complexity of the algorithm. So it is not something trivial, uh, but uh, we are studying how to modify the quantum Fourier transform to diagonalize other uh, matrices uh, that will be the considered as um, Keplitz matrices, which are something similar to the circular matrix, but introducing some additional degrees of freedom that will allow, allow us to change some um, formulations of our equation. Thank you, and um, thank you again for the nice seminar. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos, for those questions. I think that it has been very interesting. It's a, it's a PT that we need to finish now. Well, Javi, thank you very, very much. Thank you all for attending this seminar. Javi, thank you very, very much for being with us. It has been a great pleasure. I really love the part where you explain how to construct a quantum algorithm and how you need to uh, see how to construct the start the start the stay and the final information retrieval. Uh, but that's all. Thank you very, very much, Javi. It has been a pleasure and I hope we can see you again soon. Thank you for the invitation. Um, please, in case that any of you have any question I want to discuss further, you have my email. Um, please contact with me. It will be a pleasure. Perfect, Javi. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. See you in sooner. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.